one of two left-handers in the batting order for Tim Corbin's team. And there's a fastball strike from Finley. We're underway at Foley Field. Finley, the sophomore right-hander out of Richmond Hill, Georgia High School. And the 0-1 pitch. Ball struck to center field. Chad went back, now comes in and has it for out number one. Good start there for Layton, forcing contact early in the count. Also looking to extend into the later innings in this Friday night matchup. Brings the third baseman, Davis Diaz, to the plate. Had a walk-off home run with two outs in the bottom of the night two Tuesday nights ago when the Commodores beat UT Martin at Hawkins Field. First pitch from Finley is hit out of play down the right field line. Here's a look at the Vandy batting order with seven right-handers. R.J. Austin there in the three spot. He's starting at second base as the Commodores try to make up for the loss of Jaden Davis, their top hitter in SEC play. Suffered a fractured orbital bone when he was hit in the face by a pitch last week against Mississippi State. So R.J. Austin will get the start at second base tonight. But he's been one of their top hitters, Jason, and they've played him all over the place. He's been a real, uh, been, been a big pickup for them here in his sophomore season. Yeah, done a good job. Not going to see a whole lot of drop off there. I think we're, you may see a little bit as Barcy there in the DH spot, kind of juggling things around. The 1 1 pitch to Diaz outside, and it's 2 and 1. 272 on the season, five homers and 28 RBI for Diaz. Leads the team with 25 walks. Finley taking a long time, pitch clock down to two. And that misses, it's three and one. Finley making his team leading 12th start. Three and one in a 5.10 ERA. Behind in the count, three and one to Diaz. There's a strike on the inside corner. Count now full at three and two. A good quality 3-1 pitch there on the inner half. You don't see that a whole lot. A lot of guys want to stay away. Going in if you miss a little bit too fat, you can do some damage to the hitter. Finley right there establishing that inside part of the plate and the hitter's count. Diaz with 44 total hits, 15 have gone for extra bases. 3-2 pitch, fouled back. 10 doubles, five home runs for Diaz. We mentioned that walk-off home run. He had two Tuesday nights ago against the Skyhawks at UT Martin. Bandy's first walk-off home run in nearly three years since Troy Leneve did it against Kentucky in May of 2021. And that's a hard fought walk there for Diaz. He's at first with one down. And not a bad spot there from Finley. I think that establishment of the strike zone here early on, something a starter always struggles with, knowing what the umpire is going to call. You can see Gonzalez getting a, a better picture of, of what the strike zone is going to be. Right now it looks like that high strike is not going to be called. Team leading 26th walk on the season for Diaz. And the 17th walk for Finley in 48 innings of work. And now here's R.J. Austin. Playing back in his home state. Played at Pace Academy in Atlanta. Throw over to first. Vandy, the number two base stealing team in the SEC. 78 stolen bases in 90 attempts. Diaz just four for six. But this guy right here, R.J. Austin, when he gets on board, he's a threat to go. 20 for 23. And number two in the SEC himself. Austin at 302, five homers and 46 RBI. The 46 RBI lead the team. Also leads the team with 54 total hits. He's tied for the team lead, 39 runs scored. Count 2-0, Finley falling behind these last two hitters. Yeah, and I think that was a purpose pitch there to the slider. Try and get the hand out in front. He's just missing up a little bit, missing arm side just a hair. That's usually a sign that your hand's a little bit behind. So throw the slider, 
finish the pitch out in front and see if that corrects your fastball. Two balls, no strikes to Austin. There's a strike on the edge. Three and makes it two and one, pardon me. Gonzalez behind the plate for the Bulldogs today. Collins at first. Alford is at second base. Alford branches at shortstop. Condon at third. Tate's in left. Chadwick in center. Goldstein in right. 2-1 pitch. Fouled back. 2-2 two and two now to Austin. And Austin was all over that. Little arm side slider. Then they may have gotten away with one there. Brought home the winning run against Tennessee Tech on Tuesday night when he was hit by a pitch with the bases loaded. Here's the 2-2 pitch to Austin. Ball is hit to the first baseman, Collins. That's a fair ball. And Austin, with his great speed, is going to get down the line and be safe at first base. Now, that's a little strange right there. First base umpire Mark Winters making that call, but it looked as though that ball was touched on the home plate side of first base, which would be Kevin Sweeney's call, the home plate umpire. We'll see here, cue ball. And I, I think there's an argument that might have been foul and kicked back fair off of Collins' glove. I'm not sure that we have an angle that would uh, really distinguish that, but Andy could have gotten a break right there. So first and second for Vanderbilt with one down. They've been a great early scoring team this season. 89 runs scored in the first two innings this year. Here's Espinal, the catcher. Swings and misses. It's 0-1. Out of Vieira, Florida. 312, eight homers, 34 RBI for Espinal. Leads the team in homers. He also leads the team with strikeouts, 54, which is fourth most in the conference. This could be two. Branch goes to second. They get the out there. Alfred held on to it. Has trouble holding on to it. Sleeps out of his hands twice. They're going to get the out at second with Austin. So now runners at the corners and two down. Oh, that hurts right there. Taylor made inning ending double play ball here. Off the end of the bat again, kind of cue balled, but once Branch secures it, decent feed right there. And you can see he just misses the exchange. And again, kind of misses the exchange right there as well. So <laughs> Alford having a little trouble getting that ball from glove to hand. So first and second, now two outs. And here's Barzi, the DH. Runners at the corners, first and third for the Commodores. Making just his sixth start of the season, as you mentioned, as the Commodores are juggling the lineup a little bit because of the loss of Jaden Davis. Getting the DH spot here tonight. There's a strike, it's one and one. Like the classic, uh, just one batting glove, throwback. De decades of yore. <laughs> 2 11 on the season, no homers and three RBI. Appeared in 15 games with the five starts. Ball is hit to right field. Goldstein going back to the track and yeah. makes a diving catch right there in front of the wall for out number three. What a catch. 495, great fastball command. Good slider, really good changeup. You're not going to see a whole lot of speed change on it, just very effective, though, and it all starts with the fastball. Here's Corey Collins, who's already set the Georgia single-season record for hit-by-pitch. He's been hit-by-pitch 20 times this season. He's drawn 40 walks, and his 599 OBP is number one in the nation. Goes after the second pitch and sends it in the air against the shift over on the left side. And a long run for the left fielder, Polk, who comes all the way in to make the grab for out number one. And there was a good look at that changeup from Cunningham. 93 mile an hour fastball. Kind of set the tone and then he pulled the string there with an 84 mile an hour changeup. And you can see Collins just a little bit out in front, just enough to induce the easy fly ball. Well, here's Charlie Condon, number one in the nation with his 30 home runs. Now has 55 career home runs, as we already told you. He broke the 
program record. He's broken the single season record, and he's done this in half the time that Gordon Beckham had set those records. <laughs> it's just, that's, a, that's the amazing part to me. Gordon's such a great player. Played at the next level, is a great player at the next level as well. And, and Condon, to do what he's done and to better Gordon in just in half as many games, that's just words, there's not enough to describe how amazing that is. Of course, Gordon Beckham was one of the highest drafted players in Georgia history, yep. the number eight player taken in the 2008 draft. Charlie Condon, of course, just may be the number one player taken in the draft this summer. Will become the first in Georgia history with that honor. Two balls and a strike. Outside, three and one. And this is that situation where he's actually going to get challenged a little bit more with nobody on base and still kind of pitching around him. The first pitch changeup, the only strike to this point in the at-bat. Tim Corbin says you pick the times that you go after him. Mm -hmm. When he's leading off an inning, this is kind of like leading off the inning. Nobody's on base. Smashes this one to left field. Home run, number 31. Unbelievable. And when you get too much of the plate, that's what he does with it. And that might be the last time we see him get challenged for the series, uh, even with nobody on base. A perfect time right there to go after him. Cunningham falls behind, and that fastball, not a bad one. Right at the bottom of the zone, just too much of the plate. Conan with his, his bat stays in the zone so long. That's a line shot that just kept going. What an unbelievable job. Well, Charlie has a documented 87% success contact rate on fastballs, 94 miles per hour. <laughs> this is Goldstein at the plate with the bases empty and Georgia on top, one to nothing. So he, velocity doesn't bother him, is that? <laughs> Golly, 87%, huh? That's 87, at least according to MLB draft writer oh, Willie yeah. Hood. No doubt. Who has documented this. Says it drops to 69% on breaking balls. So if Charlie has a kryptonite, maybe it's that. <laughs> 69 is not bad. I'd take not that. bad at all. <laughs> Two balls and a strike to Goldstein. Pops this one up over on the left side. And Polk comes all the way in Ooh. and makes the grab behind the third baseman and jumps over him. Well, that was the shortstop. They had the shift on for Goldstein, but they had the third baseman over on the right side. Yeah. So that was the shortstop, Bastine, that Polk nearly ran over. And I, I got to say, Polk, got to credit Polk for the hustle there, but Bastine looked like he was pretty much, pretty well camped. And that almost, uh, that could have been, that could have been bad if he would have stepped on his hand there as Bastine kind of hit the deck to avoid contact. Here's Slate Alford. Smashes this one to right field. Back on the track right there at the wall. It's going to be gathered by Leneve, and that's going to be the end of the inning. But Charlie Condon. Caglione's heels there. Caglione had 33 last year. Leneve, who made the play to end the bottom half of the first, is batting to start the top of the second. He had a game-tying three-run homer in Sunday's 8-7 loss versus Mississippi State. Tied the game at 6-6. Vanderbilt in their last three games has made a bad habit of falling behind by a big number. And each time they've rallied, uh, twice they ended up losing, however. Fell behind big against Mississippi State on Saturday. Fell behind by five runs, cut it to one, ended up losing 7-4. Fell behind 6-0 Sunday, actually took the lead 7-6 and then lost 8-7 as Leneve goes down on strikes. First strikeout for Finley. 
Like a good little change up here fading away. That good action that Finley gets on that change up. He's got good action on the fastball, but that change up really falls off the table late. Here's Matthew Polk. Team leading 323 average. Vanderbilt has a team batting 291, which is sixth in the SEC. Pops this one up off the hands, and it's going to end up falling out of the hands of one of the uh, ushers here at Foley Field. Another nice Friday night crowd here. Last time Georgia was here, they had a season high 4,183 for that 15 inning affair against Clemson. Can't say that they all stayed for the end of that 15 inning game, but the season high attendance. Ball is hit down the line and foul. The way, the way things go with that Clemson game, they were lucky to get out of here in 15, I would think. No doubt. That was a short game. They had set the school record several years ago, going 21 innings in six hours. The common denominator was Todd Walker, the former LSU star, was in the booth for both of them. So he's the reason. Don't invite him back. <laughs> Assign him to another gig. I think it speaks volumes of what Georgia was able to accomplish that week of baseball. That ball's fouled out of play. It, it, they started their week off against the, the top five team in Clemson here. They had to go 15 innings and, and work their pitching through that. Then they had to go on the road to Texas A&M. They were able to get one to go two and two on the week yep. against two top five teams. Then this week on Tuesday, they beat Kennesaw State 9-3. In Kennesaw, Georgia, there in the Atlanta area, Kennesaw State, a top 40 RPI team. Did he go? They appealed down to first base. Mark Winters said he didn't, so we'll tell you about the umpiring crew. You know that Kevin Sweeney's behind the plate. Mark Winters at first, Michael Durantes at second base, and Joseph Smith is the third base umpire. One ball, two strikes. Line drive into right field. And that'll be the second hit of the game for Vanderbilt. Good piece of hitting right there from Polk. Battle a couple of pitches off. Didn't really look like he was on anything Finley was throwing him. And then with two strikes, just shortened up, served it out there to right field. 42nd hit of the season for Polk. He's already had a busy night in left field there in that first inning, making several great running catches. Here's Braden Holcomb. Holcomb, the big 6'4", 257-pound freshman out of Ocoee, Florida, who looks like an offensive lineman. They say he's got the most power on the team. He's still trying to figure it out, though. Just a freshman hitter in this league can be tough. Batting 229. Big cut and miss, and it's one and one. Four homers, 13 RBI. Nine of his 16 total hits have been for extra bases. Also has five doubles on the season. He's making his 21st start. And he's part of that uh, chess game that Tim Corbin's playing with the loss of Jaden Davis, who Holcomb getting the start at first base tonight. R.J. Austin, who started a number of games for him at first base, is starting at second base tonight. That's a big loss for them. He did have surgery yesterday, did Jaden Davis, after taking that pitch to the face. 2-1 pitches in there for a strike, and it's 2-2. Two and two. They hope to stay in the... Season long enough for Jaden Davis to rejoin them. But you got to figure they got to make a strong run to Omaha for that to happen. Certainly capable of doing that. 2 2 pitch. Did he go? Strike number three. Yeah, I think this was on the pitch right here. Kind of buffed Holcomb a little bit. That slider started right at his hip. 
he kind of break away, he tried to check, but I think it was a called strike right there. Looks like he held up anyhow. Well, Wes Johnson told us the biggest thing with Finley, just got to keep striking, pounding that strike zone. And that's been the key to his success since moving into that Friday night or game one spot in the Georgia weekend rotation. Yeah, you just feel like when he's off, it comes in bunches, and then he kind of hones it back in. You saw that a little bit in the first inning after the walk, lost the release point a little, and then got it back with the slider. So as he's maturing, finding those keys uh, in small adjustments to get back in the zone when needed. Calvin Hewitt at the plate as the throw go over from Finley chases back the base runner Polk. Hewitt out of Greenland, New Hampshire. Not the island. Covered in ice. <laughs> Finley throws over again. But as you look at this Vanderbilt roster, you'll see a far-flung roster. They've got players from all over the country. And as typical of Tim Corbin's style, they got a lot of players from the Northeast where Tim Corbin's from. Hewitt being another one of those guys. Making his 27th start of the season tonight. Takes a strike. Batting 287, no homers and 14 RBI. That's four doubles, a triple, 25 total hits. Two outs with Polk down at first base. Outside, two and one. Lots of games going on here on the uh, first weekend of May. 2-1 pitch. Did he go? Did he know? He did not as they appeal down to winners again. It's 3-1. I like to call this the pro part of the college baseball season. The kids are now pretty much done with class. Some of them done with finals. Now it's just kind of baseball. This is as close as they get to professional baseball life without playing professional baseball. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a summer ball atmosphere. It'd be the next closest thing where you're just there to play. You don't have to go to class. Don't have to worry about the paper. Get the per diem. It's always nice. <laughs> where was your go-to on per diem back when you were playing? What was per diem back when you were playing? Not much. <laughs> that, was, that was 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just had the 20th anniversary of the 2014. I think like, I don't know, like, 20, 30 bucks a game, or a day, I should say. So would you save it up for one big meal? Uh, how, did, how did you do it? Or no, just save I, it up for beer? Yeah, I just went, yeah, <laughs> I just went to Sons Italy. <laughs> Pizza and beer, right? Pizza and beer. The health conscious players yeah, I, of today wouldn't do that. <laughs> they would never do something no, like that. Not no. today. These guys are fine-tuned athletes. Drinking. <laughs> Kell milkshakes, except they're not milkshakes, they're <laughs> Kell shakes. <laughs> Vastine at the plate, batting for the second time, bounces that one foul past the first base coach, Tyler Shoemaker. Tyler Shoemaker. Mike Baxter over in the uh, third base coaching box. Tim Corbin's given up his spot over there for a long time. He would head coach the team from the third base coaching box, but a lot of like a lot of head coaches, he's given up that assignment and now calls the game's work the game from the top step of the dugout. 0-1 pitch, missed high, and it's 1-1. One and, one. and you can see Finley's going through one of those spots like he did in the first inning, just a little bit off. Small misses, but misses nevertheless. Now Wes Johnson sprints out of the Georgia dugout first. And a tough hitter in Vastine at the plate. He's third in the SEC with 15 doubles. 1-1 one, one pitch, outside, 2-1. and one. You see that recoil after that pitch, just a little bit off, and the timing of when his foot's landing and his arm's coming forward, it's just not quite in sync right now. 24 of Vastine's 49 hits, so basically half of them have been extra bases. He leads the Commodores with 89 total bases and a 586 slugging percentage. Bats there with two aboard. 
Spin move and chases back the base runner Polk at second base. Commodores failed to score in the first. They've outscored their opponents 47-29 in first innings, 42-13 in the second. 2-1 is hit in the air to the outfield. Chadwick ranging over to his right has it. And the Commodores strand two in the ninth seed. A lot of teams put emphasis or don't put emphasis on the SEC tournament. SEC tournament is something that Georgia's never won. They've won a national championship, but never the SEC tournament, which I think is all really tougher to win than the national championship. Oh, for, for the longest time, the SEC tournament was essentially the Omaha, Omaha format, but just squeezed into yep. one week. So it's extremely difficult to go out there and, and win. Yeah, and, and you're, looking, you're looking ahead, too, to the regional, so you're not going to you know, maybe pitch the number one guy Maybe hold him back to kind of set up the pitching for the regional that you're going to. Because back when I was in, you know, it was eight teams. So you, you knew if you made it, you were going to be in the postseason pretty much. Yeah, the flip side of that is Vanderbilt has won four SEC tournament championships under Tim Corbin. And I was talking to him about that prior to the game. And he said, look, I've always thought that the SEC tournament championship is a big deal. He says when you start the season, you've got three championships that you can win. You can win the SEC regular season championship the SEC Tournament Championship, and the National Championship. Yeah. They've done all that. Four SEC Tournament titles, two national titles. Two balls, two strikes to Colby Branch. Now it's three and two. Branch is now second on the Georgia team of 14 home runs, 48 RBI. He has really gone on a power binge over this last month. 3-2 is fouled out of play. He's doubled his home run total, total from a year ago when he was a freshman, all Big 12 freshman at Baylor. And Branch is one of those players too. You see the 264 average, you're like, ah. But right guy, right spot. He just seems to be in there at the right time to get that clutch hit and has several, several clutch hits on the year. And that's going to be ball number four. Second base runner for the Dogs starts this second inning right for Georgia. And here's Trey Phelps. So good to see him back in the lineup for Georgia. He was playing his best baseball, was red hot when he suffered that knee injury against Missouri a couple of weeks ago. Goes after the first pitch and hits a foul. He's a young man with a bright future. Ahead him, good quick hands right there on the inside fastball, turning that around at 92, probably a ball inside, able to get to it. Again, with his long frame, you know, that's always tough. That's the first thing you think of. You see a guy that tall, the length that he has in his arms, I think you can get inside, but he's, he's just got a good quickness to the ball. Had a big pinch hit home run in that 5-4 victory against Texas A&M on Saturday. Goes after the second pitch. And skies it on the infield. Vastine, the shortstop, shielding his eyes from the sun, has it for out number one. Coming up late now for Georgia. Like Cunningham was, had the benefit of a backup slider right there. I think Phelps was all over that. It just kind of hung in there, arm side. It beat him just a hair. Here's Clayton Chadwick. Forty-seven career doubles. He's tied for fourth among active career leaders in the Southeastern Conference. Most of that came at Sam Houston State. I was looking through all the career leaders listed in this day of the transfer portal. There's a lot of guys on those career top ten, active career top tens who have played only one season in the SEC. What do you think? Should they be included in that? Or should the numbers just be from the SEC? 
There's Chadwick with the bump back to Cunningham. Fires to first, pulls the first baseman off the bag, and he is safe. Runners at first and second for Georgia. Man, not a great bunt there from Chadwick. Cunningham had him dead to rights. You see, he's trying to get it down the line with third baseman Diaz playing so far over, but he kind of gives Cunningham a gift, but he throws flat-footed over the first base. Difficult play for Holcomb to kind of handle that. Just can't quite hang on. I'm not sure if he did hang on, his foot was on the back. They're going to score that a hit. So first and second. Here's Tate's. Here's, he's another one of those guys. We mentioned that Chadwick is tied for fourth among SEC career leaders with 47 doubles. He's number one. He has 51 career doubles. Yeah, I think that's it. And all of that, pretty much all of that came at Purdue. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's kind of tough. I think that's. I, I didn't say it now. I was going to put you on the spot. You're the <laughs> yeah. one who said No, I agree with you. I, I, that's the way I feel about it. Yeah. It's it should a, be SEC numbers. It's, it's a different league. Right. Yeah. Going through it, uh, I think you understand that. It's just day in and day out. Yeah. And everything's razor thin. Just this series alone, you're talking about the implications nine games out and how big this series is. Yeah. yeah, don't want to take anything away from Tate. He has six doubles here in 35 games for Georgia. Absolutely, yeah. So 45, the other 45 of the 51 that leads SEC active career doubles leaders came with the Boilermakers. Right. And I agree. I think most everybody else will tell you, man, SEC with other conferences, it's apples to oranges. One, two, it's not really a fair comparison. Every pitch just seems to have so many implications on it. It's a playoff atmosphere in the second half. I mean, you feel it right now. You almost feel like you're in the postseason uh, fighting to position yourself yeah. in the postseason. Yeah. Two balls and two strikes to Tate's. And two aboard for him and one down here in the second. Dogs looking to add to their 1-0 lead. They got it in the first with Charlie Condon belting his 35th, 31st homer of the season and his 56th career home run. Chadwick at first and Branch at second. 3-2 to Tates. Fouled off there at the plate. The complete game and the shutout last week for Cunningham against Mississippi State for the first of his career. And to show you how big they were, they he shut down on two hits a Mississippi State team that then came out and scored 15 runs off the Commodores the next two games. Three two to Tate's foul back. Bulldogs number two in the SEC in home runs. They're number three in the nation with 114. They've already set the program single season record. Here's the 3-2 to Tate's line drive center field. Base hit. Branch had to wait between second and third to see if that ball was going to be caught in center field by Hewitt. So the runners have to go one base. Base is loaded now for the Dogs and one down here for Fernando Gonzalez coming to the plate. Yeah, off the bat, I think Branch took off and then thought wiser of it. That ball was hit off the end of the bat. Kind of hung up there. Good piece of hitting there by Tate's good A.B. Fighting a couple of pitches off and finding his way on base. And here's Fernando Gonzalez who hit his eighth home run of the season. A two-run shot in their 9-3 win at Kennesaw State on Tuesday and stands in there with the bases loaded. Bulldogs have already set the single season record for grand slams with 10. Of course, six of those came in a six day span back in early March. 1-0 pitch to Gonzalez in there for a strike and it's one and one. So Cunningham in a hot spot here in the bottom of the second. 1-1 pitch. 2-1. and one. 
That was such a good take right there. Throws a slider for a strike, tries to get the chase. Good recognition there by Gonzo to get back into a hitter's count. Chopper on the infield, play at third base, steps on the bag there, gets the only out he can get. Run scores, and it's 2-0 Georgia. Tough play there for Diaz. As he ran by the bag, he stumbled a little bit, slamming on the brakes. Maybe prevented him from being able to turn a double play going across. So Gonzalez picks up his 37th RBI of the season. Here's Collins with first and second and two outs. Little number is going to be fouled. Collins popped up to left field his first time up. Yeah, got Collins on a changeup. Starts him off there with a the slider. The only fastball Collins has seen to this point was the first pitch. An inside fastball that he took. 366, 13 home runs on the season, 40 RBI. And a phenomenal 40 walks, which is sixth in the SEC. A tough guy to pitch to. He doesn't move. He's right on top of the plate. He doesn't move. That's the hit by pitches that he has. So as a pitcher, you already feel like that strike zone's a little bit smaller. Then he's got a lot of power threat damage. Inside corner for a strike, and it's one and two to Collins. And a great pitch there. A little changeup kind of started in and then worked its way back. Collins came into the night, eighth in the SEC in batting average and fifth in slugging percentage. One-two pitch. In the air to left field, Polk has it measured. This will be out number three. For the Dogs, add another run after loading single season and the career home run record. And now he's chasing some other records. We saw the... SEC single season home run records. He's now just two behind Jack Caglione, who had 33 last year. And Charlie's now at 31. He'll be leading off when we come back and play the bottom of the third. Diaz at the plate for the second time. There's a strike, and he's behind 0 2. He walked his first time up. And something, something else this dog's team's been able to do that I think uh, is very important in this. Very talented state, they, you know, as far as baseball goes, state of Georgia. They were undefeated against in-state opponents this season. Here's the 0-2 pitch, fouled back. The only non-conference loss they suffered was to Michigan State. That's right. Early, early well, in the year. Yeah, that was their final non-conference game before they started conference play, wasn't it? Before they opened against Kentucky. I think it was the week before. Maybe? Yeah, it was early on in the year. They had Georgia Tech right after that. Yeah, no, yeah. So it was the it was the final game in February. That's what it was. I knew it was the final something. <laughs> they actually got run ruled in that game. And the other extraordinary thing about that was Charlie Condon hit three home runs in <laughs> that game. That's right. Yeah. And Georgia got run ruled. <laughs> he hit three home runs in seven innings. It was kind of that final game before they started to get into Georgia Tech being their first right. uh, big opponent of the year. I think Wes Johnson was trying to get everybody a, a final opportunity to show what they had headed into the tough part of the season. No balls, two strikes, and that pitch is outside. It's one and two. Speaking of Georgia Tech, they're playing a doubleheader against Clemson today. The Tigers beat them in the opener. I bring that up because the latest D1 baseball NCAA regional projections have Georgia playing at Clemson in the NCAA regionals. With Clemson being a national seed and Georgia a two seed in that regional, that would be a flip of 2004, which we just kind of right. revisited a couple of weeks ago when they honored the 2004 College World Series team. And Vanderbilt is currently projected as a two seed in the Indiana State Regional. They beat the Sycamores 20 to four earlier this season. 
One two pitch is popped up out of play. That's got to be a good thing, right? If you're going to be a two seed, be put in a regional where the number one seed yes. is a team you already beat 20 to four this year. Well, that's kind of what happened in 04 with uh, Clemson coming. They, they felt like they were almost the favorites. They beat us early in the year, like 19 to four. Yeah. Turned out to be a spectacular series. Yep. One ball and two strikes to Diaz, leading off the third. He is having himself a nice at bat, fighting some pitches off there. You can see Finley trying to get him to chase. He yeah, already drew his team leading 26th walk earlier in this game, back in the first inning. Here's the 2-2 from Finley. Chopper on the infield, going to bounce over the head of third base coach Mike Baxter. Yeah, this is such a good way to lead off an inning as a hitter. Really taxing Finley to make a lot of pitches here could lead to a mistake later on for one of his teammates. Two runs, three hits for the Dogs. They've left two, no runs, two hits. Four left on for Vanderbilt already in this game. <laughs> Commodores win against Tennessee Tech on Tuesday snapped a two-game losing streak. They've gone six and three in their last nine games, as has Georgia, who've won two straight since dropping the first two games of their series at number one Texas A&M. 2-2 two -two pitch from Finley, and the count's now full, three and two. Now, what an at-bat here by Diaz. 11 pitches he's seen. This will be the 12th pitch of the at-bat. Three two pitch. Little soft liner to the second baseman Alford for out number one. And though that results in in and out, I, I feel like that's going to pay dividends possibly for Austin and Espinals hitting behind him. Now Finley has to reset and continue to stay in that zone, making good pitches. It's already up to now 52 pitches or yeah. 53 pitches for the outing. Hasn't given up a run. It took nearly as many pitches to get Diaz out as sometimes it takes to get through an exactly, entire inning. Exactly. Here's Austin who singled his first time up, and that's a single his second time up. Two for two night for R.J. Austin playing back in his home state. This is just a typical Vanderbilt-type offense. They just kind of wear you down mentally. You got the 12-pitch at bat, and all of a sudden you win that one. And then Austin comes out, gets a single. Now you got to worry about the base runner and the threat of the, the stolen base here. So a lot of things going on mentally for the pitcher. He jumps out there and takes a big lead, too. He's 20 for 23 on stolen bases this season. Here's Espinal, the number four hitter and the catcher. Throw to first, chases back Austin. As a catcher, you're kind of gearing yourself up. If I can throw this guy out or make it very competitive, I can shut it down for the weekend right here. So you're wanting Finley to keep him close and give you a chance. Espinal, the team leading 415 on base percentage. There's a strike. Bulldogs have surrendered more stolen bases than any other team in the conference. 51 out of 61 attempts. Austin with his lead off the bag at first. Throw over again. So while the dogs have only thrown out 10 would-be base stealers, third fewest in the conference, they're number three in the conference with seven pickoffs. And Finley leads with two.
As a catcher, what kind of communication is going on here in regard to the base runner and Finley? And oh, it all comes from the hand sign. Yep. Just whatever uh, whatever pick package you have, whether it's a hold and pick or a hold all together. Sometimes you'll give them a, a sign for slide step as well. I always like the slide step change up. I felt like if you get a slide step change up and speed the hitter up, sometimes they'd roll over to the shortstop and give you a nice little ground ball double play. Finley's got a good break time to, to home. He's, he's pretty quick on his delivery, definitely in that one two range, which is all you're asking for as a catcher. Just give me a chance. No balls, two strikes to Espinal. Runner not going. And that's ball one. Yeah, Austin had the green light right there. Didn't get a good jump again. A, a quick delivery from Finley. That looked like it could have been strike three. Gonzalez definitely wanted an arm side slider. Kind of hung there. Espinal homer twice in the Mississippi State Series. Throw over again. And this is a Vandy team that doesn't have a lot of home run power. They're more of a doubles and gaps kind of team. 50 home runs, which is 12th out of the 14 teams in the conference. You contrast this, Condon himself has 31. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> of course, Condon has, you know, that comparison is not favorable for a lot of SEC teams compared to Condon. Yeah, he's, a, he's in a league of his own for sure. Rated number one draft choice by Baseball America and MLB Pipeline. Austin not going again. 2-2, swung on a miss. Strikeout number three for Finley. Good job there by Finley to bear down. That was a good slider. Had kind of yanked the last one way outside. That one started on the outer edge and then broke away. Here's Barcy. He flew out to right field his first time up. He was robbed by Goldstein on a great play, diving at the wall that would have scored easily two runs. Vanderbilt just two and seven on the road in the SEC. They're three and seven in true road games, four and zero oh in neutral games. So seven and seven overall on the road. Three of their last five games have been decided by one run. Vandy's won two of those three. Throw over again. Finley getting a workout, and so is Austin. See Tyler Shoemaker, the first base coach, step in there and say something to him as he peered over into his dugout to make sure they're squared away on the signs. And again. How tough do you think a base runner like Austin makes it on a pitcher? Oh, it's definitely something you got to practice because there is that division of mindset. 0-1. There's a strike. 0-2. I think this inning on a whole, Finley's really been challenged mentally to stay in it. You had the, the long at bat to lead things off from Diaz and Austin singled, and ever since then, he's really had to bear down and be focused on him at first base and not letting him get a good jump. Almost leaning that time. He's at 61 total pitches. You count the throwovers. He's over 70. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Call strike three. And number one in slugging percentage. And you see ESPN's Kylie McDaniel has joined the list 
of projecting him as the number one pick in the MLB draft. I don't think anyone's going to second guess you if you take him one overall. Well, we'll point out that Kylie calls him the number one collegiate prospect. There's always the chance oh, you could there you go. Yep. take a high school player there. And really, the, the MLB draft is a little bit different, I think, in regard to the other drafts, like the NFL draft we just saw, the NBA draft we'll see during the summer. A lot of times it just depends on who that number one team is. Yeah, and what their needs are for sure. Oh. Financial restrictions, they're just going to walk him right there. Intentional walk number 18 on the season. So if you're not going to pitch to him with nobody on to lead off the first one. You're not going to pitch to him the rest of the game, <laughs> exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. No, I, in, in, in all honesty, though, I, I couldn't possibly see how a high school player could eclipse him with the competition that he's gone up against. And in back-to-back -back years, I think that goes undervalued. I mean, you can understand having one great year and nobody knowing about you and figuring it out, but this entire year, everyone has known who Charlie Condon was and what he's capable of doing, and he's ex exceeded what he did in his previous campaign of last year. So I... I think that's tried and true. You know, one time might be an accident, and two times is a pattern for sure. And, uh, you know, I, I just I think it, you wouldn't get second guess taking him 1-1 one, one for sure. No. Now, if he doesn't make it, you find it hard to imagine that he wouldn't, but we've seen things like that happen. Oh, yeah, yeah. If he doesn't make it, at least then as an organization, you don't get accused. Yeah, right, right. You're like, well, you had to take him. He was a no-brainer, right. But if you don't take projecting to the collegiate level what a talent he'll be. 2-0 pitch to Goldstein is fouled back to the screen. And, of course, there's also the, the high school aspect of it, like Jackson Holiday, who yeah. got drafted there as a high school phenom, you know, kind of having a high school season, kind of like what Charlie's having at the collegiate level, and he's up with the Baltimore Orioles now. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I could see that. I, I just... To me, you got, you got proven, you got some maturity. You can get him up there quick. I think in Holiday was a totally different. He's not your typical high school. Right. He grew up around the, right, the right. game. His granddad, his dad. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've been, he's been around the game since he was a, you know, could pick up a bat when he was about two years old yeah. and swing it. Now, I always think back to, like, Josh Hamilton or something like that happening where you're maybe yeah. not mature enough to handle the pressure of being on your own. 2-2 pitch, and that's ball three to Goldstein. Goldstein's another one of those guys. He's number 10 among active SEC home run leaders with 42. He's number five among RBI leaders with 162. The bulk of that coming at Florida Atlantic. 3-2, fouled off there at the plate. We already have one final in today. That's because they were playing a double header at Florida after they got rained out the national game. Got rained out last night. Tennessee beat Florida 6-2. to two, So the Volunteers just continue to roll along. And Florida doesn't. We'll see them here the final weekend of the SEC regular season. 3-2. And ball four, and Vandy will be playing Tennessee the final weekend of the regular season. Two aboard. So here's the problem with that intentional walk is now you got a, a, a mess starting. <laughs> you still haven't gotten anybody out. Now we're going to have activity in the end of the bullpen. We're going to see that bullpen start to stir a little bit. Montgomery just hit 49 pitches. Contrasted with Finley, but... It's no doubt a calculated risk when you decide to intentionally walk a hitter. Here's Alford. Alford flew out to right his first time up, and here's the risk. So you pitch to Condon with the bases empty. He hits another home run. That's one run. Right. You walk him. And maybe it turns into a big inning for the other team, like you have developing right now with two aboard and nobody out. Yeah, no doubt. And I, I think that's a lot of pressure on Goldstein. He put together a great at bat to work a walk. And that might get Charlie pitched to in his next at bat. Yeah. So count one and one. Remains to be seen whether it's going to turn into an inning, but it has the makings of one. Mm -hmm. 
with two aboard and nobody out. And the four, five, and six hitters do up for Georgia. Here's the 1-1 one, one pitch. There's a strike from Cunningham, 94. And that's the big thing that Tim Corbin told us about Cunningham is he's hotter longer. He's able to maintain that 94 and that 95 deep into games now. Yeah, that might have been one of his best fastballs right there low and away. The home run that Condon hit was a nice fastball. <laughs> it was. It got a little bit more of the plate. Yeah. That one just a perfect pitcher's pitch there on the corner. And all for such a free swinger. If he doesn't flinch at it, then uh, you know it's a, a good good quality pitcher's pitch. Alford leads the Georgia team with 49 strikeouts. Here's the 2-2 pitch outside, and it's 3-2. and two. One more ball away from loading the bases for Colby Branch, who's hit three grand slams already this season and five in his two-year career. Ball four, bases are loaded for Branch. And we said it in his last at bat, one of those guys is a 264 hitter, but in these situations, he really rises to the occasion. So don't let the average fool you, and I think Montgomery's fully aware of that. Or excuse me, Cunningham. Three grand slams this season, his most recent coming at Mississippi State in that 9-8 loss to the Bulldogs. Hit two as a freshman last year at Baylor. Not that I would ever know what it's like, but if you're a guy like Colby Branch and you come up in this situation, you've already hit three this year, is that back of your mind or front of your mind? No, I, I think the approach that led to the three is what's at the front of your mind, and that's just seeing a pitch up in the zone that you can drive into the outfield and knowing that it's not the end of the world if you strike out. I think that's that's the key. The pressure's really on the pitcher and, and not you. So you don't need to venture out of the zone if you strike out, so be it the guy behind you is good. You just don't want to ground it up into that double play in these scenarios. Just look for something up and drive it to the outfield. Branches three grand slams contributing to that program record 10. Two balls and a strike to Colby Branch. He was a collegiate baseball freshman All-American last year with the Baylor Bears and a 2-1 pitch. In there for striking, it's two and two. I see that's a good take there by Branch. That's a good pitch from Cunningham on the inner part, trying to jam him up, get the ground ball. And good discipline there for Branch to lay off it. Wait for a better pitch that he can drive. 2-2 two -two pitch. Big cut and miss at the 94 mile per hour fastball. One down in the inning. And that is the first strikeout for Cunningham, who had only four in his complete game last week. Again, good quality pitch, trying to go in. Got away with one right there. That one caught in the middle of the plate. I think Branch got a little bit long on it. Sets up the double play opportunity. Under normal circumstances, I would say probably a very difficult player to double up, but with Trey coming off that knee injury, who knows? Yep. Popped up to the shortstop his first time up. Pops up again. This one's out of play. Because Wes Johnson told us before the game they still have to really manage Trey Phelps. They don't feel like, you know, he's full go. Probably still a week away from that, right? Chopper on the infield. They'll get the middle runner on to first. Not in time. Ball gets away. Here comes another runner, and he's going to be saved. Two runs scored for Georgia. Condon scored easily on the bouncer, and then Goldstein heads up, took off, and scored after the ball trickled away from Holcomb at first base.
Yeah, the Phelps kind of rolls over this one. Could have been a double play tough. He beats the throw, but you see right there with Holcomb not coming off and knocking that down. Goldstein has the awareness to continue to score. And again, as you mentioned, worst that happens is Charlie hits a, a solo shot. Well, here they walk him, and George is able to tack on an extra run. So maybe that wins him uh, getting pitched to in his next at bat. Here's Chadwick now with two down in the inning, and Georgia with a 4 0 lead. Has two runs scored on that play, and the two runs that scored were the first two guys that they walked in the inning. Condon intentionally, and then Goldstein, after a very competitive at bat, drew the walk. Hot shot to Holcomb. He'll step on first, and that will end the inning, but the dogs tack on two more. They'll take a 4-0 lead to the... Sometimes you see that after navigating a situation as, as mentally tough as last inning was for him. Leneve leading off the inning for the Commodores, one of two left-handed bats in the lineup for Tim Corbin tonight. Struck out swinging his first time up. Behind in the count now 0-2. Well, Finley has executed some quality change-ups to Leneve in the last couple of at-bats. You know, and that's one of the things that Wes Johnson was praising Finley about his ability to get strikes with multiple pitches. Here's the 0-2. I kind of love the body language from Fernando Gonzalez behind the plate. He puts the sign down, then points to his head, like be smart right here. Giving him that little extra description of where he wants the pitch to set up the next one. There's the one-two pitch. Swing and a miss. Strikeout number five for Finley. That's three consecutive dating back to the top of the third. Yeah, a good fastball right there and a little extra jump on it. Late explosion into the glove. And that's, yeah, you mentioned three straight batters now he's struck out. Finley had a career high nine strikeouts in the opener against Missouri a couple of weeks ago. Popped up off the bat of Polk, who singled his first time up. That's out of play. Tim Corbin, legendary Hall of Fame coach of the Vanderbilt Commodores with 915 victories. They've been to 17 consecutive NCAA tournaments. He's won two national championships. They've played in four national championship series finals in the last 10 years. Ball is hit in the air to deep center field. Chadwick goes back, now stops in his tracks and has it for out number two. I've known Tim a long time. In fact, first met him when he took over back in 2003, his first year as the head coach at Vanderbilt. And we were chatting about that in the dugout prior to the game, and we had a good laugh. But I remember just how excited he and the program was that first year when they made the SEC tournament. Yeah. They hadn't been in like 15 years. And they got in on the last day of the season on a walk-off home run as the number eight seed. And it was such a big deal for them. And you could tell that the Vanderbilt program was undergoing a big change with his coaching style, his enthusiasm, his approach to the game probably never imagined that they would become the national power that they have become under Tim Corbin. It's always been a pleasure to visit with him. Just a superb job. Already inducted into the American Baseball Coaches Association Hall of Fame. So we're going to miss by Holcomb. And how, how big is that? You're still in uniform. As you're, an active coach. You yeah, haven't he. retired yet, and you're already <laughs> in the Hall of Fame.
And he looks good, too, man. You can tell he's been working out. He's getting in that weight room slinging weights <laughs> around with his players. He's in great shape. Staying young. 17 years is a long time. And 17 years consecutive, that's, that's in, consecutive the in the NCAA. 22. Yeah, 22. That's 22 right. at Vanderbilt. 28 overall. 1-2 pitch. Fouled back. Yeah, that's a long time in this business for sure. National championships in 2014, 2019. They were one win away from the national championship in 2021. And then Mississippi State came back and beat them twice. Here's the one two to Finley outside, two and two. Got him. That strikeout with College of Charleston as the three seed and Army as the four seed. But I think both you and I agree and probably, I mean, if Georgia can get the 16 SEC wins, which means they would have to go, what, six and three in their last nine. Yep. Not an easy thing to do. But if they can get the 16, I think they'll host a regional. I, I think there's a good shot. 15 might be enough. It might be with that strength of schedule. They've really navigated it well. And I mentioned that that last week, just going two and two against top five teams. You know, four games against top five teams in the nation. I, I think that would lend itself to that argument as well. It's Paul Tate's ball hit up the middle and it gets by Vastine into center field for a base hit. Hit number four for Georgia. Yeah, a little home field advantage there as Vastine took a little bit of a bad angle to that ball. He short, shorted himself a little bit, tried to cut it off, and that thing kind of scooted on him. Probably a national at Vanderbilt's field. It's a little bit slower. Georgia's field playing a little bit quicker. That ball got by him. Tate's finding himself in first base. Slower even though it's on an artificial? Yeah, I think that artificial turf plays a little bit slower sometimes. With the, you know, the little rubber, rubber pellets that they have in there. Ball is yanked foul down the left field line off the bat of Gonzalez. So Roy Lee's shed right there. So you used to call it the groundskeeper for all those years that we were, that I was here. It was Roy Lee. That was yeah. his, That's where his shed was? That was his shed. I used to pepper that thing during batting <laughs> practice all the time. Tate's at first. He has two of Georgia's four hits. And that ball is a solid shot down the line. It's a fair ball. Tate hits second, he heads to third, gets the wave sign. Here he comes around third, no throw to the plate. Georgia has a 5-0 lead, RBI double for Gonzalez. It's his second RBI of the night. Gonzalez straightening it out, making sure he keeps that one fair. And Georgia now has scored in every inning, just continuing to tack on as this game goes on. Attacking that fastball, seeing it very early. Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt is challenging Vanderbilt the call the on the field, field of a fair ball. Okay. Well, that'll be the second challenge. Vanderbilt's already used up one. After replay, After replay the call on the field will field stand. Man. Fair ball, Vanderbilt has Zero challenges left. So Gonzalez is out at second with the RBI double, and that brings the top of the order in 4.71 ERA with four saves. And hops up there on the hill with Gonzalez behind him at second. I would imagine if he has success in getting Collins out, he'll go ahead and walk Charlie to face Goldstein, the lefty that's batting behind Condon. Balls behind 2-0 to Collins. Ginther in 21 innings has 
Struck out 22, walked nine, given up 16 hits. Opponents batting just 219 against him. Collins has been retired twice already tonight on flyouts. Two and one now to Collins. In SEC play, Ginther making his ninth appearance, no record 5.25 ERA. And a couple of saves in conference action. Well, 2 1 pitch. It's now 3 and 1 to Collins. Collins plate discipline, you just can't nibble. He doesn't venture out of the zone. He feels very comfortable hitting with two strikes, so he finds himself in hitters' counts like this one a lot. Swing and a miss. Collins is going to get a chance at pro ball. Now a senior, he'll be drafted in the summer. It's just a matter of where he goes. But he was totally frustrated with the game at the end of last season. And he draws the walk to a board for Charlie Condon. There was talk that Collins might just give up baseball altogether. Yeah, great story. Happy to see him back in the senior year. And having such a good senior year, I think that at bat right there kind of tells you you got a guy like Condon hit behind you. It's a lot of pressure off of Collins. He's going to be very selective knowing who he has hitting behind him and that he does just as much good at first base as he does getting a hit. And here is Charlie Condon already with his 31st homer of the season tonight. Takes a strike. Not only is he a great power hitter, he already has a 16-game hitting streak now, that home run extending that streak back in the first inning. Line drive off the screen. It's behind in the count, 0-2. And, On pace to hit 38 home runs during the regular season. Pitch missed inside. As we showed you the list earlier, that would be the SEC record during this bat era. Yeah. One, two. Now it's two and two. Three-time SEC player of the week. D1 baseball and perfect game midseason player of the year. Golden Spikes Award midseason watch list, maybe the, the favorite to win that award. Hard to imagine he's not in the top one or two. 2-2 two, two outside, 3-2. and two. All for a young man who had no power conference or any conference Scholarship offers coming out of the Walker School in Marietta. 3 2 pitch. Fly ball to center field. Did not get enough of this one. It's going to be taken by Hewitt out there. Gonzalez is going to tag and go to third. So that's the first out of the inning. Runners at the corners for Georgia. This is the fourth consecutive game that Vanderbilt has fallen behind by at least five runs. They did it again on Tuesday against Tennessee Tech. They were down big against the Golden Eagles in that game in the midweek. They were down five runs for coming back for a walk-off win in their first extra inning game of the season. Here's the 1-0 to Goldstein, right at Austin for out number two. So Genther is now just an out away from getting out of this mess. They've done a good job of coming in. And just a quality left-handed arm, really. 
deflected just enough to get inside of Charlie's barrel, which is not an easy thing to do. I think he threw him a little cutter there, had some yep. late action, got inside. Charlie had the right launch angle, the right timing, just missed the barrel on it. And then right there gets the line out. Hallford fouls it back to the screen. I think kind of the book, the, the, the line of thinking here with Condon is throwing breaking balls. Yeah, no doubt. But if you get too much of the plate, he'll destroy it. Oh, yeah. And you got to speed his eyes up a little bit, so you got to mix a fastball in there, even if it's off the plate. And you're definitely not going to blow it by, that's for sure. And he showed great discipline in that at bat. Laid off some pretty, pretty tough two-strike pitches. So he doesn't venture out of his zone very often either. One ball, one strike. Chopper on the infield, and there's going to be out number three as Austin covers the bag at second. RBI coming from Gonzalez, the number nine hitter. Hewitt, number nine hitter for Vanderbilt, leads off the fifth. Walked his first time up. One of two walks for Finley tonight. No activity in the Georgia bullpen. Finley's career best from an inning standpoint is five and a third against Alabama earlier in the season. But he's been very consistent at that five number. And we mentioned, though, with Cunningham going 122, this is that time of year, starting to warm up. Everything's coming together. You're getting into that postseason mode. So you might see them stretch Finley out into that, beyond that century mark. Haven't really seen him throw much more than 100, if that, in any outing to this point. Here's the 2-1 from Finley. That's a strike with the breaking ball. And it's 2-2. Two two. Yeah, Finley has been five innings in each of his last three starts against A&M, Ole Miss, and Missouri. Call strike three. That's seven punch outs for Finley. Boy, you got to love that. You see Gonzalez knew it right away. He had called the right pitch and set it up perfectly, and Hewitt didn't know it was coming. So Gonzalez, as soon as he catches it, knows it's a strike and the nonchalant flip over to first. It's a good feeling as a catcher when everything kind of gets set up perfectly to freeze a batter on a fastball like that. What's happened with Finley here? He struck out five of the last six. You know, again, I, I think it almost benefited him having that division of mindset. He stopped thinking so much about whatever was off in his delivery rhythm that had him a little all over the place he's been sharp just getting ahead early has command of, of all three right now but especially the fastball and the, the slider so a good change up right there but it, again he's just kind of settled in Bastine's 0 for 2. He's flown out the center two times. Of course, as soon as we say that, he's, he's now 3-0. That's the way it works. Always. Always. Finley approaching his career-high strikeouts. In fact, he just threw a walk right there. That breaks it up right there. Bastine on board with one down here in the fifth. Third walk. Third walk for Finley tonight. I'm just investigating the numbers. I thought his career high was eight strikeouts. But I'm seeing in one spot where it's seven. So I'm trying to do a little. Yeah, so apparently it is seven. So he has tied his career high already. 
Diaz at the plate, no balls and a strike. 0 for 1, walked in the first, lined out in the third. You can see Tyler Shoemaker there, the first base coach. He's got a stopwatch in his hand. Tell them what's the number they're looking for, typically. Anything over 1-3 typically is what you want uh, for a good opportunity to steal, that right. is. You, you just running the math, it's about 3-3 three, three for the runner, the base stealer, to get to second from the time that pitcher lifts his leg. So typical catcher is about a two flat down there, so you want... Anything over that 1-3 range. Finley's uh, below that 1-3. He's got a good quick delivery to the plate. Decent move as well. I think they might be looking, if they're going to do anything in this situation, Vanderbilt has, they try and wreak a little bit of havoc. So try and get something going. You might see a hit and run if the opportunity presents itself. And Alford shifted way over to that second base side. That's something Vanderbilt just traditionally has mm -hmm. always been good at. It's hitting behind the runner on that hit and run which is normally a low percentage play, but they do it very well. I don't, I don't think you'll see a straight steal in this situation down by five. Wes Johnson said, you know, this is pretty much a typical Vanderbilt offensive team. They've got speed, stolen bases. We mentioned they're second in the conference, hit and run, bunting. They're kind of taking the bunt out of it here, falling behind by five runs, swing and a miss. You can see 78, second in the conference. Georgia's 51 allowed is first in the SEC. Would seem like a good combination for them, but it's not quite as cut and dried as just looking at the numbers. Yeah, and again, Finley has a good delivery. Right, play Finley's too, done a really so good job. It doesn't really match up with a guy that, that gives up a whole lot of stolen bases, doesn't throw a whole lot of dirt balls either. So he's a hard, hard guy. That means his fastball and his slider are both hard pitches, velocity-wise. Throws back over to first again. He's had at least 20 throwovers tonight, hadn't he? Yeah. Again, that short, quick arm action over there kind of helps him find that release point if he loses it a little bit. Vastine's 8 for 11 in the stolen base category. One of those stolen base, like you mentioned, probably not on the table right now, but they do have three guys on the roster with double-digit stolen bases. And then Bastine with eight is number four on that list. Two balls, two strikes. Cold strike, Finley, new career high strikeouts for him. That's eight. Diaz was not happy with this call. A great catch by Gonzo, reaching out and getting it right at the bottom of the zone. I mean, that's just fantastic. He won that pitch probably. It might have been about a ball off, definitely at the bottom part of the zone, but a good catch there by Gonzalez to earn Finley his new career high in strikeouts. Here's Austin. He has two of their three hits tonight. Last time took a little bit different lead right there. It looked like he dropped his right foot like he was getting ready to go possibly. I think that would be a, a time to take a chance with Austin at the very worst leading off next inning. I was going to say you got three, four, and five right here, and you already have two outs in the inning. It doesn't hurt you to risk something right here because even if you get thrown out, now you got three, four, and five due up in the top of the six. Yeah, and you feel like you want to get something out of this base runner as well with Vastine uh, reaching on a walk, the leadoff guy. You want to get something out of it. So maybe getting him in the scoring position, you might risk it right here and try and chip away at that lead. Yeah, the probability of scoring a run with two outs and just a guy at first base is pretty low. Swing and a miss. But if you can get him to second, and two outs, the, the chances increase dramatically. Yeah, you just had back-to-back -back breaking ball, so you might have missed your shot. Again, a good job by Finley throwing over there. 
Finley chases him over again. One ball, one strike to R.J. Austin. He had a three-run homer in Tuesday night's win against Tennessee Tech. And then when, as we mentioned, he got hit by the pitch with the bases loaded in the 11th to bring home the winning run. But the home run that he hit against Tennessee Tech on Tuesday night was originally ruled a double, but then went to review and got overturned into a home run. The review hasn't been as fortunate for Vanderbilt tonight. <laughs> They've lost both challenges already. Two one from Finley, breaking ball, strike, and it's two and two. Four straight breaking balls there to Austin. He didn't look comfortable on any of them, so might be a theme here for Finley, just sticking with the slider. Finley is a big kid, 6'5", 235. He's what you're looking for in a right hand. Power right-handed arm. Really coming into his own for this Georgia team. Just turned 20 years old back in March. Two two pitch got him. Strikeout number nine for Leighton Finley. By far the best in this day of heightened awareness coming off Maragna Gate <laughs> at Texas A&M. Well, I think uh, Ginther might have brought out his own rosin bag. There's two back behind there now, so the other one might have been out of out of rosin. He brought his own out, and I think Kevin Sweeney maybe just checking it, making sure it was just rosin. Who knows? Well, you know, the story of Maracna was there was video that surfaced, I think, from Barstool of Maracna in the bullpen crouching down, and then there's Branch with a line drive into center field for a base hit. Sixth hit of the game for Georgia Branch, his first. Anyway, it won't belabor the point too much, but it made the national news. I, I clicked on a story from Fox News and they were covering it <laughs> for some reason. And the, the video was suggesting that Maracna, who had struck out six of the seven batters that he faced against number one Texas A&M, was somehow using a foreign substance to doctor the ball. There was no proof other than this video of him crouching down in the bullpen. He could have been doing anything. Could have been talking to himself, picking up a grasshopper in the corner <laughs> of the bullpen, uh, and then him touching the, the, you know, the leather straps from his glove that were dangling down. And could be anything. And I, I just thought it was a, a story that kind of took on a life of its own and had legs with no concrete substance, pardon the pun, to it. <laughs> and then Jim Schlossnagel, the Aggies' esteemed head coach, made a comment to an AP reporter who asked him about it, kind of threw some gas on it. Well, I can say this, there was no contact from the SEC office to Georgia about it, nor should there have been or could there have been the umpires were there they did nothing there was nothing from the umpire and it was a whole fabricated story you know, kind of the power of suggestion with your video and, and you know let's run with the story here I mean just logically Marak has been 91 to 93 with his fastball it's been blowing by guys all year long with that extra little jump or ride as they call it and uh, in that outing he was 94 96 so it was jumping even a little bit more I think that was a uh, more to the factor in his performance than, than anything else. It was all done with the fastball. Fastball wasn't moving funny. To kind of piggyback off that story, Vanderbilt did have a pitcher, JT Thompson, who pitched on Tuesday night, who just came back from a four-game suspension. 
they had found a foreign substance on his forearm when Vanderbilt was playing Florida a couple of weekends ago, and he got suspended, which is the NCAA mandate for using a foreign substance as a four-game suspension. Now you, as a former ball player, all-SEC catcher, assistant coach, two-time minor league all-star, you don't have a big deal. You don't have a big problem with it, right? No, that, I mean, I don't really. I, mean, I feel like batters get to use the pine tar for a little extra tack to hold on to the bat. And I know pitcher's got the rosin, but, you know, some guys you know, need a little extra tack. You see a lot of guys lick their fingers to try and get a little bit more grip. You know, everybody's a little bit different. You so can make the argument it's for safety purposes, right? Yeah, just so you have a little bit more feel for the ball in some of those uh, extreme weather situations. Uh, it looks like he really wanted to <laughs> talk to Kevin Sweeney more than anything else. And just to put a bow on the Maracna story, you know, I think anytime you're getting publicity for college baseball, it's a good thing, right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> no such thing as bad publicity. I mean, it made it, it was, you know, it was a national story in some uh, aspects this past week, so great. Gosh, Diaz way off the line for being in a bunt defense. They still have Chadwick played the pull. Here's the 0-1 outside to Chadwick. It's 1-1. One one. Well, Chadwick lays a good one down the line. I think he might end up getting a hit. Work, yeah, working his way to first base with where Diaz is set up. And with two strikes, he's going to have to just make sure he gets the job done. One ball, two strikes. Branch out at second, and Phelps is at first. Two and two. Chadwick working on a one for two tonight. Singled in the second and then grounded out in the third. One for two. 2-2 two -two pitch. Call strike three. Ginther gets it done. A couple of close pitches going Ginther's way there. A good catch there by Espinal. Again, got to credit Sweeney. We mentioned in the first inning, he wasn't giving that high strike, but this is now the second one right at the bottom of the zone that he's awarded to the pitcher. So. Staying consistent. I think the one pitch in that at bat that was a little questionable was the second strike on that outside fastball. But again, a good job by Espinal in the catch and winning the strike. Here's Tates. He's two for two tonight, has two of Georgia's six hits. Scott Brown, we saw him after he visited Ginther. It really looked like he had words for the home plate umpire, Kevin Sweeney. You think that helps? I, absolutely. I think you do it the right way. and You, you put the message and said, hey, man, you're not being sharp back there. Take a longer look for us. 0-1 is lifted in the air to deep right field, going back to the wall, and it's gone! Paul Tates with a three-run homer to blow this one open. Georgia has an 8-0 lead. Big shot there by Tates. Get there breathing a bit of a sigh of relief after getting a strikeout. Preventing Jordan from executing the bunt, and then he leaves the fastball up. And Tate takes advantage opposite field. That ball up in the zone, probably out of the zone, and drives it to the outfield. That ball just kept carrying. He got a good piece of that over the bleachers. Backside, bottom of the order coming through again for Georgia. Third home run for Tates, RBI 15, 16, and 17. And a big night for Paul Tates in the eighth spot. That now means that five of Georgia's eight runs tonight have been driven in by the eight and nine hitters. Gonzalez has a couple of RBI as well. Little number off the end of the bat. Ginther gets over there to cover the bag. That'll be out. Number two. Yeah, that bottom of the order coming through in a big way. 
Metro Gonzalez with two RBIs. Tate's now with three. Phelps in that five hole has another RBI. And of course, the uh, home run by Condon that got things going. Yep. So it'll be interesting to see how Vanderbilt approaches this from a pitching standpoint. Collins at the plate. We've seen teams, you know, since we've gone to the run rule in SEC baseball, we're not saying that you they're raising the white flag by any means, but it changes your approach as to who you're going to pitch when you fall behind by eight runs in the fifth inning. Yeah, and you save some of your pitching, but you yep. also save the opposing team's pitching too. And you got to remember, Finley's still out there. So so far, Georgia just used has just used one arm. So if you go maybe deeper into the bullpen. And shorten the game by, you know, like you said, not waving the white flag, but maybe not throwing some of your elite arms, saving them on the back end and shortening the game. You might actually help Georgia out a little bit yeah. uh, with their pitching staff. Ball is popped up into shallow right field, charging in and a diving snow cone catch made by Lene for the final out of the inning. Sometimes you end up with your best outing when you, you struggle through and kind of find it piece things together. Seems like one inning, the changeup's good for him, and yep. then it goes away, and then it's the slider, and then the fastball, and it's just, it's one of those uh, bodies of work. He's put together a good one here so far as he pitches into the sixth. The only bad part, that pitch count's getting up there. So you're not sure how much longer he'll stay in the ball game. And I'm anxious to see, you know, eight run lead. He's done a good job at getting through five uh, we'll see how long Wes lets him go and, and what his stamina has built up to at this point of the year. He has struck out six of the last eight batters that he's faced. Espinal was the start of that streak that I just mentioned after that single that you alluded to by Austin back in the third. I mean, and he, um, I'm interested to hear from you what you feel like was there a switch that flipped because he faced a lot of traffic prior to this striking out six of the last eight. Yeah, I, I think there was. I think he was maybe another strikeout. That's 10 now, three in a row, seven of the last 10. And that looked like a backup slider, so kind of got away with a mis-executed pitch that just stayed up and in. And Stayed right over the bat of Espinal. But yeah, that slider's really come along here in the last couple of innings. We saw him throw five straight to Austin, and Austin didn't look good on one of them, so a little extra something with that. I mean, six of the first 12 batters that he faced reached base. Yeah. And since then, he has struck out seven of the last 10. And I had mentioned at the time that that division of mines had the stressful inning he had there in the third, but I think that might have actually benefited him from taking his mind off of exactly what he was doing and allowing him just to I go think by muscle on, I, I think you've hit on something yeah. here, <laughs> Dr. Watson. <laughs> I may have. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, makes sense. In fact, the exact opposite of what I would have been thinking, because I, I remember I asked you the question, I'm thinking this has got to be bothering Finley, right? And it looks like the exact opposite kind of, came true. Yeah, in this case, it kind of just got him out of his own way and allowed him just to do the muscle memory that he does every day down in the bullpen, working on his stuff. And now he seems to be in a nice rhythm and kind of settled in. As in again, he's ahead 0-2. And he has been absolutely dominating since that single by Austin. And then like it seemed like 10 throwovers <laughs> during the at-bat by Espinal. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to the battle, in, battle that he had with Diaz, the 12-pitch the at bat that he had. That could have gone the complete opposite Another, way. Another, my goodness. Seeing a historic performance for Finley here, 11K. And again, another great slider just disappearing late. That's four in a row. Eight of the last 11 that he's faced, he has struck out as he has reached 100 pitches. Now we'll see if he still has feel for that changeup here against Lanive.
And typically, in this situation, this would be a game in which Brian Zeldin would come in as the piggyback to the starting pitcher. He's down there just standing on the mound, not throwing yet. Well, somebody's coming in because <laughs> this is probably the last inning for him. Popped him up. It's already a career best performance from an innings pitch standpoint. Oh. And sliding attempt by Tates can't come up with it. So is it five and two thirds, which is better than the five and a third that he had against Alabama back in March. So all the way around, this has been a career performance for Finley to this point with the 11 strikeouts, the five and two thirds, not to mention that he's working on a three hit shutout into the sixth. One one from Finley. Missed low, two and one. Remember, Bulldogs pitchers had a combo no hitter into the seventh on Tuesday night against Kennesaw State. In fact, they carried that into the eighth. Two one missed high, three and one. Matt Stewart along with Jason Jacobs. Georgia out to an 8-0 lead here in the series opener. We'll be with you the entire weekend, 2 o'clock Eastern for game two tomorrow, and then 1 o'clock Eastern for the Sunday finale. 3-1 is fouled out of play. That's Letterman's day, right? It is. Y'all do something every weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse to get out of the house, hey, hey, you know, come to Athens. Yeah. Of course, you live here, but I mean, for some of the other guys. That's right. That's for some of the other guys. Honey, I'm going to Athens again. It's Letterman's <laughs> Day. What did Letterman's Day last weekend? <laughs> Here's the 3 2 to Lemieve. Backhanded by Branch in the hole. Long throw. Stretched by Collins to get the final out. Defense hasn't been tested much tonight. And in Condon is when he steps into the box. There's a strike from Huseman right down the middle. Right, good challenge right there. That's in his presence with authority with that fastball in. A one pitch. Nice play by the shortstop, and Bastein throws him out. Hot shot, one down in the inning. So Condon has been retired twice tonight. He's officially one for three at that home run. Genther, the number two pitcher tonight for Vanderbilt, went two innings, gave up a couple of hits, three runs, all of them scoring on the home run by Tates. One walk, two strikeouts, 40 pitches. Goldstein is 0 for 2. Walk in the third. Thirty-seven total hits for Goldstein this season. Twenty-one of them extra bases, ten doubles, and eleven home runs. Fourteen different Bulldogs have homered for Georgia this season. They've blown by the previous single-season record, which was 109, set by the 2019 in 62 games. Called strike. It's three and one.
Bulldogs up one spot in the D1 baseball top 25 this week, 20th, so that's respect. You lose two out of three at a &M and you move up. Goldstein draws the five-pitch walk. You don't see that very often. Drop a series on the road and move yeah. up in the polls. No, no doubt. I think, you know, all body of work, you know, they did get the win against Clemson. Yeah, they were well, so two and two. Yeah. So that played in their credit. The victory over Clemson, a team that's been top five most of the last month to six weeks. Boy, that AM club, that's that's a good club too. They're animals. There's Alford. I mean that in a good way too. <laughs> AM one, Arkansas two, Tennessee three, Clemson four, East Carolina up to number five now. That'll be interesting to see. Nothing against the Pirates. Pirates have a well established program. I mean, they're they're a great program. But they don't play, and no knock on the American Conference, but they don't play in the SEC. They don't play in the ACC. So when they track, they get in the rankings. I've seen teams like this do this. They get up higher and higher and higher. They just simply don't face the competition week out, week in, week out, the yep. teams in the SEC do. So they tend to track and get higher in the rankings than maybe an SEC team will that might be just as good, maybe even better. And it remains to be seen. Maybe East Carolina is a top five team. Oh, we'll yeah, see. no doubt. You know, yeah, Coastal Carolina do it. Or they won the national champion yep. coming out, you know, kind of a mid-major going in there and doing it. So, yeah, that, it's absolutely possible. But they're up to number five this week. Pirates tracking towards a national top eight national seed. 3-1 pitch is hit well to center field. Hewitt tracking back and kissing goodbye. Alford with the two-run homer. And Georgia now has put the game in run rule territory with a 10-0 lead. Boy, that was a missile. The right center field backside. That ball had a lot of carry. Just touched the top of the trees as it carried out. Got all of that going the opposite mm. way. Good finish right there. See this thing. That cleared the trees out there, just the tops. Home run number 13 for Alford, RPI number 51 and 52. He's seventh in the SEC and runs batted in. Here's Colby Branch. So with that home run, Georgia now just three defensive outs away from finishing the game. I think Kevin Sweeney was telling Michael Durantis at second base, get out of the way. <laughs> that's what it looked like, isn't it? I think that's the second time he's kind of obstructing his vision of the pitch clock. So Georgia now three outs away from what would be their 14th run rule game. They're 10 and three in one in run rule games. Ooh. Alford's home run went 419 feet with an exit velocity of 108. Whew. It was well struck. Commodores are six and one in run rule games. Their one run rule loss coming to Texas A&M a couple of weekends ago. Branch swings and misses. Two down in the inning for a strikeout for Huseman. Yeah, tough day there for Branch. He's getting a little bit long on a couple of bats. Got himself a single in his last at bat. And he's missed a couple of pitches. You only see him hit just kind of swinging underneath him.
Trey Phelps. Looking for his first hit still. He's 0 for 2. Walked in the fifth. Scored on that home run by Tates. So now that you have positioned yourself from the Georgia standpoint to run rule this game, I think it's a lock solid bet that you know Zeldin does come in and and nail this thing down quickly. And Zeldin's really shown the ability to have kind of a rubber arm uh, where he oh, could yeah. go ahead and yeah. throw 15, 20 pitches, get you through that inning, three up, three down, uh, hopefully, if you're Georgia, and then be, able, be available tomorrow and on Sunday. The trifecta, huh? Yeah. Just available. You know. Yeah. It all depends. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the Georgia pitching situation looking a lot better than it did maybe a month ago with Colton Smith. And, man, he has just been spectacular. Yeah, I think that was really tested in that 15-inning game you mentioned last week against Clemson. They just kept running guys out there that, you know, performed. And Goldstein's back. He'll be the game two starter tomorrow. Yeah, that helps against the Commodores' Carter Holton. 3-1, hot shot, gets by Vastine into left field for a base hit. And there's that hit for Phelps. And again, see if they pinch run for him here. Again, Vastine just a little bit late on the react. You can tell that Georgia Steele played a little bit faster than what he's used to. In the inning, which has not been a bad thing for the Dogs tonight. Over Chadwick's head. Single for him back in the second. Every Bulldog in the order has reached base tonight. It's now 2 0. Oh. Three and oh. Winner of this game gets to 33 wins before the other. Both of them locked up at 32. Dogs at 32 and 12, and the Commodores at 32 and 13. But they would even up in the conference standings. Both would be 11 and 11. There's a strike, three and two. And I think more importantly, Jason, when it comes to head-to-head -head competition, when it comes down to the end and the committee's looking at who's a regional host, these are two teams with very similar resumes. Yeah, absolutely. And at least for tonight, Georgia kind of grabs the upper hand in the first game of this series. 3-2 pitch, walk team. I wonder how long it's been since he had a haircut. <laughs> Action in the dandy bullpen here. Last nine coming over to kill some time, it seems. Tate has three of George's nine hits tonight from the eight hole in the order, including that three run homer back in the fifth that we showed you just a moment ago. Dongs already have a two run homer in the inning on the laser shot by Alford. Huseman looks back at second, 1-0 pitch. In the air, down the right field line, got a lot of carry to it in the corner, and it's to be caught right up there against the wall by Laneve on a foul ball. But Georgia adds two more. The rule win. They got the ideal start for the Bulldogs entering into this weekend. Again, it's a three-game series, so you're just looking to take two and defend your home field. Anything beyond that's a bonus. 
Seven, eight, and nine due up for the Commodores here. And Polk at the plate for the third time tonight. Swings and misses at the first pitch from Zeldin. 33 strikeouts, 18 walks, and 35 innings of work. Opponents batting 248 against Brian Zeldin. 0-1 pitch. It's quickly ahead, 0-2. This is the 242nd all-time meeting between the Bulldogs and the Commodores, according to Georgia, dating back to 1897. One-two pitch in the air popped up. Going to get to the overhang. The Bulldogs lead the all-time series 124-117. Georgia's last series win Back in 2021, when the Commodores were number one in the country and reached the College World Series National Championship Series, Dogs won two out of three in Nashville that year. One-two pitch, hit to center field. Chad went racing back, and right in front of the track has it for out number one. A great job there by Chadwick. Good jump on it. He covers a lot of ground out there he in does. center field. He's done a good job coming on in the... Billy Carver's stead after he banged up his knee at Mississippi State. Yep. Dylan Carter continues to be sidelined by that knee injury suffered, sliding into home plate against Mississippi State. In game two of that series, Chopper to the third baseman, Condon backs up and fires, and that's out number two. As Holcomb is retired, and now the Commodores are down to their final out. The good instincts there by Condon, knowing that he had time, knowing what his clock was with Holcomb, the first baseman, running there, didn't panic. Stayed back, make sure he feels it, delivered a good throw in the first. Calvin Hewitt steps to the plate for the Commodores. A walk and a strikeout for him tonight. Strike one. Strike two. Zeldin, one strike away. O2 pitch. In the air, that should do it. Branch calls for it. Dogs win.
in this day of heightened awareness coming off Maragnagate <laughs> at Texas A&M. Well, I think uh, Ginther might have brought out his own rosin bag. There's two back behind there now, so the other one might have been out of out of rosin. He brought his own out, and I think Kevin Sweeney maybe just checking it, making sure it was just rosin. Who knows? Well, you know, the story of Maracna was there was video that surfaced, I think, from Barstool of Maracna in the bullpen crouching down, and then there's Branch with a line drive into center field for a base hit. Sixth hit of the game for Georgia Branch, his first. Anyway, won't belabor the point too much, but it made the national news. I, I clicked on a story from Fox News, and they were covering it <laughs> for some reason. And the, the video was suggesting that Maracna, who had struck out six of the seven batters that he faced against number one Texas A&M, was somehow using a foreign substance to doctor the ball. There was no proof other than this video of him crouching down in the bullpen. He could have been doing anything. Could have been talking to himself, picking up a grasshopper in the corner <laughs> of the bullpen, uh, and then him touching the, the, you know, the leather straps from his glove that were dangling down and could be anything. And I, I just thought it was a, a story that kind of took on a life of its own and had legs with no concrete substance, pardon the pun, to it. <laughs> and then Jim Schlossnagel, the Aggies esteemed head coach, made a comment to an AP reporter who asked him about it, kind of threw some gas on it. Well, I can say this, there was no contact from the SEC office to Georgia about it, nor should there have been or could there have been. The umpires were there. They did nothing. There was nothing from the umpire. And it was a whole fabricated story, you know, kind of the power of suggestion with your video and, and you know, let's run with the story here. I mean, just logically, Maracan has been 91 and 93 with his fastball. It's been blowing by guys all year long with that extra little jump or ride, as they call it. And uh, in that outing, he was 94, 96, so it was jumping even a little bit more. I think that was uh, more of the factor in his performance than, than anything else. It was all done with the fastball. Fastball wasn't moving funny. To kind of piggyback off that story, Vanderbilt did have a pitcher, JT Thompson, who pitched on Tuesday night, who just came back from a four-game suspension. They had found a foreign substance on his forearm when Vanderbilt was playing Florida a couple of weekends ago, and he got suspended, which is the NCAA mandate for using a foreign substance as a four-game suspension. Now you, as a former ball player, all-SEC catcher, assistant coach, two-time minor league all-star, you don't have a big deal. You don't have a big problem with it, right? No, that, I mean, I don't really. I, I feel like batters get to use the pine tar for a little extra tack to hold on to the bat. And I know pitcher's got the rosin, but you know, some guys you know, need a little extra attack. You see a lot of guys lick their fingers to try and get a little bit more grip. You know, everybody's a little bit different. You Zero. can make the argument it's for safety purposes, right? Yeah, just so you have a little bit more feel for the ball in some of those uh, extreme weather situations. Uh, 